here to talk about the big thing we have hardly talked about today, and we've been talking about kids for a whole day, technology. Whoa. And I'm going to try to do it in the context of the guiding questions that we have for this lovely conference that I'm very happy to be at, which is how do we grow a good person, how do we inspire, what should we teach, how can we help, and I'll try to answer those questions at the end. The way I've come to think of myself after many years of figuring this out is practical visionary. So I'm visionary in a lot of big ideas, but I try to be very practical for what we need to do today. And my background is in science and math and music and business and education, so I try to bring those things all together. What do I know about young minds? Well, the most important thing that we know for sure is that today's young minds grow up in a very different context, certainly than I did and probably than many of you did in the audience. And I'll just show that context visually because it's pretty interesting. And you may have seen this. This is, uh, my kid didn't get that. But it's all over the world. This is my son, Sky. Uh, you can see all these people doing this in many different contexts. And that's Sky again. But the most interesting thing is that technology is the air they breathe. And I don't know who first said that. It wasn't me, but I love the quote. And some, of course, take this farther than others. Like this guy. <laughs> and I thought that was unique until I found this last night on the internet. And the interesting thing is that even those who don't have technology, and let's acknowledge that there are lots of people in your country, in my country, and certainly throughout the world who don't have it yet, those people are aspirational for it. And it's coming to them, and certainly it will be there pretty soon for lots of reasons that we can discuss. This is a quote that really caught my eye because I totally believe it. It says that the millennials, the young people worldwide, are more similar to each other than to the older generations in each country. The kids in Paraguay where I was last week are more similar to Australians and Americans than they are to their Paraguayan or Australian or American parents. And what we all need to learn is how to use this technology wisely which is a, puts us all in a tough situation since we don't all know. We didn't grow up with it. But interestingly enough, His Holiness, who is now big on Twitter, if you don't know that, this is one of his earlier tweets, His Holiness thought it was prudent to make his office open and accessible to a more youth and technologically advancing audience. So he's realizing that the power of technology to this generation is really, really important. And the key perspective that I have learned from a young person in a panel like the one we're going to have in a few minutes is this. The young man said, you guys think of technology as tools. We think of it as a foundation. It underlies everything we do. And that's really important because for young people today, technology is foundational in the same way that reading was for our generation. We wouldn't teach anything, we wouldn't do anything, we wouldn't consider somebody wise if they hadn't done reading. Now technology is taking that same role. So in order to understand these young minds, we'd better look at the context that they're living in today. And I want to point out, because this is very important, that they live, and we all live, but especially they live, in this context of VUCA. And if you haven't heard VUCA, VUCA is a word now that's being used in military and business, and you can Google it. It stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Volatility? Well, I'll just think about my country. They, they said many people thought for a long time your house's value will always go up, until it didn't. Right? Or your kid's standard of living will always be better than yours, until it isn't. Uncertainty? This blew me away. I, I met a scientist who Skypes into classrooms in Canada, and I said to him, what's the message that you give to kids when you talk to them? And his answer was unbelievable. He said, everything I'm about to tell you kids is wrong. 
And what he means is, it's our best guess. Things are changing so fast, we're learning so much, that everything in almost every subject is going to be different in their lifetimes. Complexity, there are twice as many people in the world than when I grew up, and that has to be more complex. That's really big. I grew up with two and a half billion, now there are more than seven billion. And ambiguity, these terms didn't exist. Frenemy, competition, but they're important these days. So things are much more ambiguous, and we have VUCA. But much more than VUCA, we also have accelerating change. And lots of people know about change and talk about it. I want to put the emphasis on the accelerating, because that's what's different. It's not just going faster. It's going faster and faster and faster. So it took a decade to decipher the first human genome, but you can go down and pay your money and get your own genome deciphered in about an hour today. And soon it will be instantaneous. And that's the kind of world we're moving to, faster and faster. And now every minute, new technology is conceived and born. And now I'm going to share with you a secret you have to promise not to tell because I've learned how this happens, how this new technology is conceived. It happens like this. It's born for the young people to learn with and learn about. But wait, there's more. Because in addition to VUCA and accelerating change, it's a world that's increasingly networked, networked together. And the first big major experiment in the world in making everybody, mostly young people, but really eventually everybody, nodes on the network, not just with the possibility of being connected, but connected very frequently and interacting with each other, that's Facebook. And Facebook is now almost a billion users, so that's a seventh of the population and it's growing. So here's the world that the young people grow up in today. They see in all these fields, in science, in technology, in engineering, in math, in the social sciences, in humanities, in the arts, they see huge advances. And these advances are almost all a result of adding technology, even, interestingly enough, in the spiritual world. And they see a world in which everything is more variable, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, rapidly changing, and connected. And that is the only world they've ever known. They've never known a world like we did that wasn't like that. So our goal, in my view, must be to bring these kids into the future equipped with the skills that will allow them to function and thrive in this new and different context, which is a context of wearable computing. Some of you may have seen Google Glass that is already out. And we have contact lenses that are electronic where you can watch the football game in your contact lens. And we have phones that fit in your earlobe and we have chips that are coming into your body. And within their lifetimes, the kids that we see on this stage are going to have technology that's a trillion times more powerful than the technology of today. So that's what we're dealing with. And the implication for me is that we'd better really rethink our perspective to at least three things. Our young people, our technology, and what's most dear to me is education. And this is my belief. My belief is that we greatly underestimate our young people. And I think we heard some evidence of this earlier. We greatly underestimate the power of our technology for good. And we greatly, greatly underestimate what an education could be and should be for our kids. So let me talk about those three things. Our young people. We sell them unbelievably short. What do they want? Well, we've heard some of these things. These are my five things that I have heard in 33 countries around the world. They want to be respected and trusted. We heard a lot about trust. Have their opinions valued and count. They want to connect. We heard that as well. Cooperate and compete, both with their peers and with others, around the world. Their world is no longer this. Their world is the entire world. They want to follow their own interests and passions 
and not be bored. They hate being bored. They want to create, especially with the tools of their time, which are the most powerful creation tools ever in the history of the world. And they want, and we definitely heard this just a few seconds ago, they want everything they do not to be relevant or appropriate, but real. And what I discovered in going around is one of the things that adults, and maybe hopefully not the people in this room who've come to this kind of a conference, adults lack respect for young people to a huge degree. Time, the me, me, me generation, we even heard that from the Dalai Lama. They have the attention span of a gnat. I've heard this come out of teachers' mouths, literally in those words. And we get mutual disrespect. Turn off your devices and do something important. Compared to my life outside school, I have to power down. I remember hearing kids saying that in Scotland. As opposed to what we need, which is the mutual respect. And a big part of mutual respect, it turns out, is separating what was important in the time and the context that we grew up and what is and will be important in the current context. Because digital immigrants, I've talked about natives and immigrants for a long time, immigrants are the people who've lived in two contexts, like myself, pre-digital and digital, whereas the natives know only the digital context. And what happens is that digital immigrants bring this enormous amount of baggage, often, from our last context, and we load that up on our kids in ways that are inappropriate. There are some things, of course, that are appropriate, like ethics and some of the other things we've heard about today in compassion, but there are lots of things that aren't, like thinking this is the worst thing in the world, right? If it's at your dinner table or a cafe or something, oh my God, they're each on a machine and they're not talking to each other directly. They may be talking to each other. But for them, that may be the best party ever. <laughs> right? That's their thing. That's what they do. That's the world they live in. And we have to be very careful about being judgmental about it. My belief is that what's happening really is these kids are adapting to this new context. They're doing it much more quickly than we are. They're in the process of moving to a skill set that's very different than we do, certainly very different than we teach in our schools, which are all about the past and the last century and the things that we did back there. They're doing so much faster, and we can very easily, if we're not careful, hinder them in this process of adapting to their own world because so much of what we do is top-down and education and everything else we do top-down. If you look at this picture, you'll see that top-down is very good for the people at the top. It's not so good for the people at the bottom. And those tend to be our young people. So we need much more balance of top-down and bottoms-up, and the only way to do that is to listen, and that's what we're gonna do in a few minutes. Now, because of technology, these kids' capabilities are greater than they ever have been, and they're likely, very, very likely to be a transformational generation in the world, but unfortunately, we waste this because with all the capabilities they have, we essentially give them nothing important to do with them. We don't say, oh, go out and make our network better, go out and make our system better, go out and make our education better with all you know about technology. No, we say do the old schoolwork. So we need to see the young people differently. Not as little us's who are not quite developed, not as the test scores or the test scores we want them to be, not as problems, but as individuals, individual people with passions and hopes and dreams and capabilities that young people have never had before. Are they different? Well, they grow up differently, we've seen that. Many of them look different. Their habits are different. A lot of people ask, are their brains different? And the answer to that is certainly, except that we don't know exactly how, because brain science, for all the good it's doing us, is very, very early, and we can't make any absolute conclusions yet other than that the brain is plastic. But what we know for sure, for sure, is that the capabilities are different because their brains are being incredibly extended and enhanced by technology. 
So let me talk a little bit about technology and brain gain. We sell the benefits of technology unbelievably short because we're always so focused on the problems and we are focused disproportionately. Yeah, there are issues and there are problems, but compared to the benefits, they are tiny. Technology is key because we are a human machine society. You may like it, you may dislike it, but it is what we are. And the real question is how do we make it the best one for all of us? So what about wisdom? Wisdom now comes not from the human brain alone, as if it ever did, it comes from the human technology symbiosis. Even in the past, this guy Socrates, you all know him, we wouldn't know him at all if it weren't for technology. It turns out, because he hated writing things down, he thought everything should be kept in your memory. Well, he had a little friend who was a tech geek named Plato, who wrote everything down. And because of that technology, that's why we know Socrates. And a lot of wise people have been using this. The rumor is that that may be why this pope resigned to play with his iPad. Unconfirmed, unconfirmed. A lot of supposedly wise people combining these things. Some people have it built in. You saw that this morning. So why do we need the technology for wisdom? Because though our human brains do certain things well, there are things that they're not good at. Using trillions of data points, dealing with extreme complexity, predicting the future, remembering everything. And the brains are being enhanced in these directions and completed by the technology. The technology is an extension of our mental activity. And digital wisdom, for me, is putting together the things that our brains do best with the things that technology does better. So it's not just the left brain and the right brain. Now we have to deal with the extended brain and all those extended brains networked together. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what's different about today. And that's what my book Brain Game is about. And the kids know this instinctively. If I lose my cell phone, I lose half my brain. My phone is my third hand. Should we turn it off? That's not what's happening. Some people say, but we're moving to aorta. Always on real-time access. And one of the huge problems that we're going to face in our time is what do we keep in our heads and what do we delegate to our machines? And we're already facing that. A 10-year-old in one of my panels, in olden days, you had to memorize phone numbers. Can you believe it? I stopped having to remember how to calculate when my phone learned to do it. Why should I? And so in, if this is true, it means that once we delegate the stuff, turning off technology, even temporarily, is making us not better, but lesser people. And we have to be real careful about that and separate digital wisdom from things like digital cleverness, the gadgets, and on the bad side, the hacking, from digital stupidity, not backing up, or there's a huge list of stuff that I've done. Uh, my favorite is the person who downloads a paper from the internet with somebody else's name on it, and they submit it to their teacher with the other person's name still on it. That's digital stupidity. And that we use technology not just trivially to do old things in new ways, but powerfully to have new capabilities and do things we couldn't do before like Skyping and tweeting around the world, like using databases and computation engines like Siri and Wolfram Alpha, 3D printing, simulations, virtual worlds, complex games, robotics. These are all new. But at the same time, let's remember the message from this morning. There are things that technology can't do for us. And along with the ones that we heard, the compassion and the trust, my two favorites are empathy and passion. And that's what we need in our schools. And that brings me to education, which is the last second here. We sell the potential of education incredibly short. Because we think that the goal of education is learning. But it's not. The goal of education is becoming. Learning is just a means. It's one means to becoming a better person that we're talking about. And so many people in the world today think education equals test scores and PISA and where do we stand? And that produces what the kids have told me they call cellophane kids. 
teachers who look through them at the curriculum and the test scores. So to prepare today's kids for tomorrow's world, we need to change how we teach and what we teach. I wrote a book on how we teach. It's downstairs if you're interested. We need to partner, but that's not enough because it won't solve our problem. The real problem is what we teach. We need a new core. We need to replace the math, language, science, social studies that we have now, some of which is important, with what I call the new core of effective thinking, effective action, effective relationships, and effective accomplishment. And when we do this, and I'm calling this right now the uplift curriculum, we'll get lots of the things that we talked about today that everybody says is missing from education, the critical thinking, creative thinking, the mindset, the resilience, the entrepreneurship, the innovation, the ethics, all of those things should be there, taught to kids from the very early age as the basis for later on when they specialize and need to learn the facts and the content about whatever they're interested in. All of this, of course, on a foundation of technology and reading still and doing. And we will still have some of the old stuff, but we'll do it differently for each student based on their individual interests and talents and passions. So that's my goal now is to write the book about that curriculum. The basics are effective thinking, action, relationships, and accomplishment in an atmosphere of mutual respect. Ah, you like that one. We can go back. So the conclusion is this. We have these four guiding questions. Here's what I think. We grow a good person by teaching them effective thinking and action and relationships and accomplishment and digital wisdom. We inspire young people by giving them respect and empathy and choices and challenges and by having faith in them to run their own world. We should teach by helping them find and follow their passions, by partnering with them, by focusing on the thinking and acting and relating and accomplishing and by future-cating and not what we do today, past ucating We need to show reverence for the past, sure, but not live in it. We can help by listening to them non-judgmentally because our kids' voice is the biggest thing lacking in our educational system, in, our, in fact, in our social system. And the final thought that I'm going to leave you with is this. For a long time, men dominated the decision-making. And we spent the last century getting women to be equal. And now the 20th century was very much about listening to the women. And now you're all here. Well, now half the world is over 25 and half is under 25. And almost all of what we do is top-down, goes one way. It needs to become both ways just like in the other case. And my hope for the world is that the 20th century, 21st century, will be about listening to the kids. So thank you very much.